Well, a very good afternoon, if it's afternoon where you are, and welcome to this conversation with uh, Phil Rogers. Now, I am not sitting in my elegantly appointed library. I'm actually at the Goldmark Gallery in a sanitised pod upstairs, surrounded by all the stuff that Goldmark do. And Phil, you are in the Marston Pottery in Ryada, where you are locked down. I am in my house in Ryada, yes, and um, yeah, we haven't been off the place for... for months now. You know, I spoke to um, a farmer the other day and I said, one of my parishioners, and I said, um, how are you doing with social isolation? He said, I've been socially isolated since 1974. So <laughs> not quite the same for you, but you do live on the edge of a town and you are a potter and you do work at home. So I guess for you, your, your sort of daily pattern of life has not been too interrupted. I, I said almost exactly the same thing the other day that I've been, I've been self-isolating for 42 years. <laughs> um, no, it, we're very lucky. We're luckier than most people because we've got space outside. We've got a couple of fields we can walk in um, and we've got loads of jobs to do. It's not like we're bored and sitting around. We've got plenty to do. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're lucky. I wouldn't like to be stuck in a small flat in the middle of a big city with a couple of children off school. It must be hell. Yeah. Um, Thank we're very lucky. It happened now, and not in January and February, which would have been unbearable. Right. And it's not. It's very strange how, as soon as the lockdown started, the weather brightened up, and we've had, yeah. we've had hot, sunny days ever since. Really, I think it's been <laughs> the loveliest and the most awful spring simultaneously that I can ever remember. Yeah. We've also got the internet, of course, which is allowing us to speak to each other now, Phil. But it's also allowing people to see um, this wonderful show that you've done for Goldmark. I don't know how many you've done for them now. A fair few. This is the fifth one, I think. The fifth one. Yeah. And it, it is a bit strange not having an opening where you get to meet everybody because that's the bit I enjoy, you know, meeting and chatting with all the people who come and buy the pots and so on. But it's just the way it is. And, and uh, Mike uh, Goldmark and the team have, have done a good job and they've made it the best that they can, you know. Um, I've just had a, a walk around and it's been... It's, it's been terrific. I mean, for all the usual reasons, which is, you know, you're a master and it's great to see your work. But there's new stuff, Phil, some of it really striking to me. I've loved the stuff you've been doing with, correct my pronunciation, Bung Chong, where you're using that Korean te technique, where you've got that very sort of dark green glaze on what seems like almost a metal-like um, clay, and then a, a hakame over it. And then those very simple decorative marks, which... Mm. Remind me of the sort of uh, the kind of hammer uh, vocabulary of Marx, if I can put it that way. And that stuff's now very prominent and strong in your work. Yeah, it has. I've been working on it for a few years to try and get it as right as I can get it. And I don't know if it's if it's there yet, but I mean, it's certainly it's developed over ooh, probably four or five years, I guess, getting the clay body right, um, getting the right slip put on, and um, and I enjoy I enjoy the sort of physical act of doing it. Yeah. Um, kind of in the knowledge that if it goes terribly wrong, I can wipe it all off and do it again. But I mean, it, it gives you a little bit of freedom. Um, but yeah, Hamada said that Hakame was at the same time the most simple of techniques and at, and also the hardest technique because it's easy to become over, overthink it. Yeah. And try to um, try to get a, an effect that is almost sort of preconceived in a way. Yeah. You've just got to let go, and you've just got to do it. And unless it's a disaster, you take you take what the brush gives you. But you can only do that. You can only be free when you kind of know intimately what you're doing. Can't you? You can only let go when you've got something to let go, which is the kind of decades of. Uh, the painstaking acquiring of skill and technique and also discovering who you are, who you are, you know, what kind of a pot you are, what kind of person, what sort of an artist you are. That's true. Uh, I think a lot of that kind of technique, and it's the same with the brushwork, a lot of it is just confidence. The hardest thing for me in that whole area of what I do is the brushwork. Because I've, I, I've never really been a brushwork potter. I've always been somebody who decorated in the clay, really, and then relied on the glazes to make that decoration interesting. 
that's why I always use those sort of fluid ash glazes. So the brushwork has been something of a challenge and finding two or three um, motifs that you can use that you feel are successful without that brushwork looking kind of pseudo or cheesy in a way. Uh, and I don't always get it, if I get it right at all, I don't always get it right. But um, yeah, that's been the, of all in that, in that sort of Punchong area, that's been the biggest challenge is getting the brushwork. The, the Hakame, I, I feel the Hakame is a little bit like when I draw in the clay, you just have to do it. You just do it and you don't think about it. I remember I was taught a little bit by my friend, uh, Lee Kang Yo, who also shows at the gold mark. He's a Korean potter. And at the time that he was trying to show me how to do it, he couldn't speak English. He's much better now, but in those days he couldn't speak English. And the only thing he kept saying to me was no thinking, no thinking. That was all he could say, no thinking. And I know exactly what he meant. You just had to do it and not, not overthink it. Yeah. And allow your, oh, exactly. Just that it's so easy isn't it, to have conscious thought interrupting processes, which are perhaps not fully conscious and shouldn't be conscious. But the other thing I thought, um, walking around the show, I've just walked around, was that if I didn't have my specs and couldn't see the detail, the stuff that's very distinctively you, the kind of finger marks, the kind of lugs, the pellets that you stick on the surface of pops, I'd know it was you because of that distinctiveness of that, that nuka look, the salt, that lovely red, deep red um, uh, glaze that you have. It's, I mean, you're always doing new things, Phil, but you can always tell that it's you. I love that high kink you have on the handle of a jug and you know you can see that from a hundred yards away and you know that it it's you even if all sorts of interesting new things are happening on the surface of the pot it's nice that you think that and uh, that, that's really you know that's satisfying but i think for me having been making pots now for, for professionally for 42 years what keeps me interested is finding um, new avenues to explore. When I started, uh, you know, back in 1978, um, it was very much frowned upon that if you tried different things, your pots had to be of a certain type and sort, and you were, it was encouraged that you stayed within certain parameters. Yeah. And when I was trying to become a member of the Craft Potters Association, I remember being rejected a couple of times because they felt that the pots were in their words a bit all over the place but as you get older and as you've been in the business for, for a long time that aspect changes to being a virtuoso yeah <laughs> and and it's now seen as a, a little bit of a of something to be applauded that you can, you've got these skills and i i have no worries about making very different sort of Pots, as long as, as long as you, as you say, they all look as though they were made by me. There's a really interesting thing which I've not seen before. One is a sort of flower motif, deeply impressed flower motif. Yeah. There's a, and also there's this kind of like it, marks made with a fork-like scraper, I think. And there's a glaze which has got a sort of tiger's eye look to it. There's this amberish sort of colour which gives to a dark, treacly brown. Kind of, and I've not mm. seen that before. And I was wondering, well, that's a new one. Yeah. Does it come from somewhere? Does it come from inspiration, imagination? Are you looking elsewhere? I think it was, it's just, uh, in, the, in Japan, they would call that glaze ame, A-M-E. And it's a brown, toffee, treacly ash glaze. And um, I set out to, to make that glaze or as near to it as I could get, you know. Flower thing, that is um, a, a, a clay stamp I picked up in an antique shop in Korea, which is meant for impressing rice cakes. Uh, that was why it was initially uh, intended for, um, and I just use it in in the clay instead. Yeah. Another thing I've noticed is the impressions the marks are kind of deeper and more emphatic. There's a lovely pot 
where, which, which is dimpled, something I've not really seen before in your work, I don't think. And then in those dimples, there's a sort of trellis-like pattern with a dot oh, yeah. in the centre. Yeah. But it just seems to be a lot more happening on the disruption to the surface of the pot than I've seen before. That pot um, was really tricky because I had to throw it without the neck on it so that I could get my hand inside to be able to press in without completely distorting the pot. Because if you don't press in with some kind of support behind where you're pressing, you just basically go right through. So you have to have your hand inside to, to press against. So I yeah, and then once you've done all the pressing, you then add the neck on on afterwards. You know. So dimples are difficult. Well, those were because they were quite big. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The thing I'm I'm really enjoying, well, lots of enjoying it, but it's, it's the, these big dishes, really big dishes. Mm. And there's one I was just looking at, and you have that, I don't know what it's called, but there's that um, green glaze, which kind of pulls in the base of a circular a sort of dish shape, and then it becomes glass-like and crackles. It's a beautiful thing. What's that called? Well, that's that's ash glaze. That's the pine, pine ash glaze. But where it pools... How can I explain this without getting too boring? When the glaze is, is thinner, the clay underneath has much more of an effect on the finished quality of the glaze. Where the glaze is thicker, because it's run into those areas, because in the kiln it's quite fluid, it becomes thicker, and exactly what you say, it becomes more glass-like, because it, the clay underneath has less influence because there's so much glaze on top of it. So it's all about the glaze and not about the clay, or much more about the glaze than anything. Yes, it is, yeah. Unless the glaze is thin, in which case the slip and the clay underneath has more of an effect. So it's another thing I, I saw, which I've, my eyes have been drawn to again and again, is again these impressions, deep impressions, round. And then you pour into that a very, almost like a ghost slip, a very pale white-grey slip that trickles down, but trickles down within parameters obviously and then there's a mm. kind of three lines incised on the inside of the dish and it sort of stops there but again you get this sense that there's something very fluid and very um, uninterrupted happening but around it you set parameters through these heavy marks through the limits of the clay through the shape of the pot and there is always this tension isn't there between um, what is free and what is given I love that about pots mm. What you're seeing is is nuka glaze on top of the ash glaze. Right. And to do that, all I do is wipe my finger around the bin and get a big lump of creamy glaze on my finger and wipe and literally just sort of place it on the top of the pot. And then in the firing, that glaze melts and runs down. Um, I often feel with, the, particularly as the dishes get bigger, great expanse of that green ash glaze even though you know the firing transforms the glaze and you do get textural things going on especially if there are marks in the clay I sometimes think that it just needs something else and those nuka runs the runs that you're talking about that cascade down the side of the pot I feel just gives the eye a way of entering into the space somehow yeah that's interesting yeah, yeah. Another, uh, hasten, the word innovation in theological terms is slightly kind of disparaging in a way. It's like we shouldn't really be doing that because we're custodians of a tradition. But another thing I've noticed is that in the Bung Chong, Bung Chong stuff is that there are new shapes that you're making. And is that because the shape is to an extent dictated by what's happening with the hakame and with the shapes that you make in the hakame. There's a bottle shape that I've not seen before in your work. And I just wonder what leads, is it what's happening on the surface or is it the, the shape of the pot that, or how does that work? When I'm throwing, I've got it in mind all the time. What am I going to put on this later? So the pots are, as I'm throwing, are sort of designed in a way to take certain glazes and literally 99 times out of 100 I'll know when the pot comes off the wheel I know what glaze is going to go on it. Um, the thing that keeps me interested in making pots is working out new forms and new shapes 
And I probably make too many new shapes, to be honest. I think that, um, there's a f quite a few that I make really don't, don't ever make it into the kiln because they just don't quite work. But that's what kind of keeps me interested is, is trying to devise and think about new shapes, new forms, and the way they're orchestrated and the way they all fit together, the angles and so on, how it all comes to fruition. Um, and I was watching the film that we did last time, uh, yesterday, and um, when Max was doing his walkthrough, the, the film was on. And um, there was a little bit in there where I, just off the cuff, I just said that throwing was a little bit like drawing in the air, and that's where they got the title from the film, of the film from. And it's true that when you're throwing, you, I'm constantly asking myself questions about, you know, the way a line is changing from one angle to the other. Where's the shoulder going to be? What's the height of the pot in relation to the width of it and the neck and the rim and where's the handle going to go? And all of these questions running through your head as you're throwing. And um, sometimes it works beautifully and other times it doesn't work very well and you, you kind of those end up back in the bin. But um, that's the thing that keeps me really interested. And as I say, I think I probably make too many new things. I, but, um, and on the other side of it, the other side of the coin is that I was looking through last time's catalog the other day in the, in the workshop and um, a lot of the pots in that catalog I could have made just yesterday. Do you know what I mean? It, it, in two and a half years between the shows, two and a half years in terms of the development of, of any creative pursuit, particularly pottery probably, we have to wait so long, fired and kilns to cool and all of that. Um, two and a half years is, is not very long in terms of development. And so there are things that you do two and a half years ago that are actually very similar to the things that you do now, you know. So it's it's a, I wonder what, I did a thing recently where I unearthed some, I was tidying up, which doesn't happen very often, and I found a cache of old diaries and photo albums. Remember when we used to have photo albums? Mm. And I kind of went through them. The thing that was really fascinating about them was how the sort of um, chronology in my memory is completely different from the actual chronology. So when I look at the evidence, I look at the date on the back of a photograph, I find that things that I thought were completely remote and unconnected to each other happened on the same day. And I wonder if pots, in a way, give you a sort of biography or a CV that, you, that surprises you sometimes. Yes, it does. And when that when it shows itself more than any other time is if I happen to come across a pot that I made, let's say, 10 years ago, and I still remember who bought it and where it is, you know, it's, it's that, happen, that happens a lot. And I, I noticed that with pots is that they do have a sort of end user part of their memory, as if the life of the pot doesn't, in their memory, in their, but doesn't, finished when it leaves the pottery it has a mm. life that continues in the collection or the use of somebody else the funny thing happened this week because a, a guy that i knew about 20 years ago who was a, a big collector he collected a lot of pots his name was michael and his collection was sold at auction just this week and there were three of mine in the auction and one of them, I felt, was one of my better efforts, let's say that. <laughs> and um, I just couldn't believe that it was made 20 years ago. Because I could have made it last week, you know. And that's the other side of it. That whilst you, you, know, you spend the last four or five years, <clears throat> pardon me, developing this punchong thing, which I, I've enjoyed doing. And then there's this other pot, which was... 20 years old, but could still have been made just recently. It's a, it was strange. Maybe there's a sort of necessary forgetfulness in creative processes. So you feel that something is happening for the first time, but actually it's happened before. Anyway, look, I've got questions coming in. Can I? Oh, right, OK. This is from uh, Qatar. I hope it's pronounced that way, in France. It's a general question and relates to what we've just been talking about. What are your sources of inspiration? and which ones have priority? I 
kind of look at pots a lot and they can be old pots from different cultures and different ages and I also look at you know fairly contemporary work not so much very contemporary but certainly 20th century so um, I've always been interested in Korean ceramics right almost from the time I started uh, so there's that and certain certain Chinese pots again more when I started than now I don't really look at that so much now but there was a time when German salt days had a big influence because I was making salt days for you know 16 years although I haven't done any for well probably 10 or 12 years now um, when I built the wood kiln I really wanted to try and find a way with it that was maybe a little bit different to what everybody else was doing and so I, I looked very hard at um, Shigaraki pots from Japan <clears throat> and I I, what I did was I took about 30 analyses of, of Shigaraki clays and turned it into one sort of average analysis and made that up chemically with English or British materials to, to create that reddish wood-fired clay that you were mentioning in, in, uh, earlier on. Excuse me a minute. Sure. <coughs> Sorry. Um, I like very much, I looked a lot at... Um, settler pottery in down, all down the, the east coast of the United States, which was made mostly by Dutch and German immigrant potters in the late 17th and 18th centuries. Um, English slipware. I've never made any slipware, but there's something about the way that slipware was decorated, going back to what we were talking about with Hakame, you know, the guy that decorated a, a slipware pot probably did 50 or 60 in those in, in the day. Yeah. And he didn't have time to sit and think about it. He just had to do it. And he did 50 or 60 the day before. And it just became part of his hand. It was part of his personality, you know. Um, and that influenced me, that, that very direct and very unfettered, totally uh, no hesitation in the decoration. And, of course, when you're drawing in the clay, you can't afford to have hesitation. It's got to be... It's got to look spontaneous, otherwise it doesn't work. So there's been lots, lots of influences. I mean, I could name, I mean, to anybody, Hamada was an obvious influence. Um, Bernard Leach, kind of, not quite so much, really. And then there are one or two British potters who are almost contemporary to me that have been influences. Richard Batram was an influence. Mike Dodd was an influence. They all, they preceded me. Uh, certainly Richard did, and, and um, Mike Dodd was probably seven or eight years going before I got going, because I was teaching for five years, and um, so I sort of wasted five years. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not true. Well, but, well, I mean, you, it, it, you were in pedagogic making... mode at that time. Say that again, sorry. You were in pedagogic mode at that yes, time. Yes, that's it, yeah. Exactly. Was, yeah. I, sp I used to spend a lot of my time in, in a gallery in Cambridge called Primavera. I, I lived near Cambridge at that time. And um, I'm sure that, the, that it was owned in those days by a man called Henry Rothschild, who was part of the Rothschild family. And um, I'm sure he must have thought I was some kind of shoplifter because <laughs> I would be in there on a Saturday. I had no money. I mean, I was earning £70 a month in those days. I had no money to buy anything, but I used to just stay in there for an hour and looking at all the pots and people like Ray Finch and Walter Keeler and Leech Pottery and all of these pots that were in there. And they formed very much a foundation of what I started to do. Because those pots um, I gravitated towards, you know, um, thrown pots for use, essentially. What about outside pots? What about life? What about um, the stuff? It's hard life. to talk about that. So how, how, what influences your work that's outside the um, connection you'd have to other potters and other pots within that praxis? Well, people, sometimes people say to me, oh, you live in a beautiful place and you live in the countryside. And I honestly think that my pots would probably be the same 
if I lived in the middle of Manchester. Oh, because we'd love to say, wouldn't we, that it's, it takes on the hues of the Welsh um, geology around you and it's full of the mm. drama of the Welsh landscape and the distinctive light, interplay of light and water, but you think that's not the case? I think it's partly true. I mean, every day I take the dogs into the fields twice a day and I, I look around and I look at the leaves on the trees and the branches and the silhouetted against the sky and that, that filters in. Um, but I can't honestly say that, um, I think, mm, difficult one. I mean, there are aspects to the decoration sometimes that I'll do on the pot where um, there's one bottle in the show I can think of where I've put a wavy line around the pot and then I've drawn a little plant-like thing. Around, yeah. And that wavy line for me is a landscape. It's a, it's a hill, it's they're hilltops really. And I look out of my window and I can see that wavy line across the valley on the top of the mountains. So there is that. I, but I can't, I still think that if I lived in, in the middle of London or in the middle of a large city, I'd still be using ash glazes. I'd still be interested in Korean ceramics. I'd still probably be using the same sort of glazes and things. And maybe the decorations would be slightly different, but I, I, I still feel that it's it's more the way you it's what you gravitate towards really yeah maybe not that such mysterious it kind of creeps into your unconscious where so many of the decisions in mm. art are made if they are decisions aren't they um we've got one here from gerard molinar who's in the netherlands um since 1974 a serious hobby potter yeah potting always a joyful way to fill my extra time what do you fill your extra time with, Phil? Although the amount of pots you turn out, I'm surprised you have any at all. <laughs> That's kind of true, really. I don't have a great deal of extra time. My wife, Hashong, she bought me a metal detector for Christmas. So I've been out metal detecting in my fields. A fantastic present. Yeah, yeah. You found I anything? Found, yeah, I found a couple of, well, I found two Elizabethan sixpences. 16th century and um, William the Third silver sixpence and one or two other interesting things. So yeah, it's, it's great. But, but I think I've sort of searched my two fields to death now. I don't think there's anything left to find. But um, we'll have to try and find somewhere new to go with it. Well, is it I mean, what else do we do? Um, because you have a young son, of course. I've got a six year old, so that takes up some time too. Uh, his interest in Star Wars is quite prodigious. Yes. <laughs> he's very bright. He's much, he's much brighter than I ever was. And um, he's six years old and he's, I, as part of his homeschooling, I've been getting him to write a diary on his laptop at six. So he now knows how to insert pictures into Word. And um, he, he, he gets the, is out of his email, saves them to a folder, inserts them into the Word document. I mean, it's amazing, really. And terrifying, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think... How long before we get overtaken by people whose age is measured in a single digit when it comes to technology? <laughs> yeah. What about your Welsh, Phil? Obvious thing to say. You live in Wales. You're very rooted where you are. You're, and remember, the, the, the place where you live, the architecture, which go, you know, often people are living in houses which are six, seven hundred years old and they conform to a very particular type. Being Welsh as a sort of, is that important to you? Oh, yeah, very much. Very important. Does that mean you get uh, sentimental at rugby and like to sing um, Cum Ronda or something? Or it's much oh, more yes. Important? I have done in the past. <laughs> not, not so much now because I sit and watch it on the TV, but... In the in the old days, I never missed an international. I went to them all, and uh, we used to sing. And yeah, I mean, I'm I'm Newport, so I'm not I'm not Valley's Welsh, you know. Um, I, Newport is a is always a border town, so I don't have that rich Valley's accent, which I wish I did have, you know. Every whenever I hear, whenever I go to the rugby and I hear Welsh people sing Calonlan. I want to be Welsh because I want to be part of something 
that has got such solidarity about it. And in the 1980s, I was involved helping support a pit village yeah. in the miners' strike in the July Spally. And again, there's this kind of corporate thing, this sense of solidarity and community that I really, really loved and still do love. And that's interesting because you live a very solitary sort of life doing your thing. The tradition that you stand in is not a distinctively Welsh tradition. Your idea of extra time is going out metal detecting, which is hardly uh, throwing yourself into a throng of people. But that's still resonant for you, this idea of the community no. of solidarity. We're a small country, see? Yeah. We're a very small country, and it's amazing how often, you know, I know that the arts community in its broadest sense is, a, is even smaller than Wales. Uh, but it's amazing how often. I'll bump into people who I've never met who know somebody quite close to me that I know, you know. It's, it's, so we feel that because it's a small country, we feel that we know everybody somehow. I, I, um, but does that also... We, so I can say that it also I've noticed it with Welsh artists, that there's a kind of community which extends beyond the discipline. So it's not just potters knowing potters, but you'd know painters, writers, weavers there's mm. um, it, it it goes across those boundaries that's right there's Cuffin behind me Cuffin William. Yeah. we were quite good friends for the last six or seven years of his life um but yes i mean they, they not quite for me for me not quite so true in the last what five or ten years but there was a time when i was on the crafts board at the Welsh Arts Council, and, and I knew a lot of people then, and used to talk and interact with a lot of people. I don't see so many people these days, I have to say. But, um, that's probably not <clears throat> not wanting to be bothered to get out and do it. But, um, my sort of committee life of the Arts Council in Wales and with the Craft Potters Association and with Royal Cambrian and all of those things, I kind of not a meetings person really and I, I kind of you know have running the CPA for four years uh, there was a lot of meetings involved in that and, um, and it was it was fine I, I was quite happy and proud to do it but I, I, I can't say I miss it really. It's a bit like being the poet laureate isn't it you'll never write anything while you're doing that because it's a different sort of thing. Um, viewers from all over the world not just Wales, Argentina, India, Netherlands, Boston, Vancouver a question from Bonnie in Pagliazzo. Bonnie wants to know, could you expand on the tension between working with recurring themes and doing something new? <clears throat> Anything new is always, well, for me anyway, is always a development of something that I've already done. So it's not, it's never absolutely new kind of taking something and moving it moving it to a different place and so for instance with the punch on things um about i think 2003 i know that because one of the molds has got it written into the plaster um i had a, a spell of a really bad back and i wanted to get off the wheel for a bit and so i made some press molds which allowed me to make parts without having to sit on the wheel. And so when, and I used those molds for years, you know, years and found different ways to glaze them, decorate them, treat them and so on. So one of the fascinations of that was that you have two pots, which are basically the skeleton is absolutely identical because they've come out of the same mold. But because of the way you treat them, decorate them, slip, glazes, whatever, whatever, they take on hugely different personalities and, and characters because of the surface. And so as I wanted to bring the sort of punch-on type work into, into the front, I started off using the same moulds, but with that treatment, and then sat down one day and made three or four new moulds and new shapes. Um, and the Hakame thing, I was doing that 25 years ago uh, under the ash glazes. But 
Punchong, as, as I've said before, there are three elements to it. There's the very dark clay that you mentioned, that almost metallic clay, the white slip, and, and the clear glaze. And so it's, it was a question of taking that technique that I used with ash glazes and then substituting a different glaze for the ash glaze. It's, a, it's, it's, nothing, it's not new, it's just a development of something that you've done before and you move it into a slightly new or different place. Is it also about appropriating what others... Are, I mean, you stand on the shoulders of giants. You often get this with potters, don't you? Especially, I think, in Japan, those kind of family hire... There's a genealogy, isn't there? Literally father to son sometimes. Or mm -hmm. in somewhere like Mashiko, you get a sense that there's a community of people who know each other. And that it's not just the single potter. It's a single potter in a relationship with other potters. And that, and that also um, creates both creates the sort of discipline, the tradition in which they work. It's fertile. But that happens here too. Yeah. You know, not, I'm not talking about the father to son thing, although that certainly has happened. I mean, you think of uh, Michael, Seth and Ara Kaju, there's Bernard, David and, and Johnny Leach. You know, there's, those things have happened. But there's also, um, I can only speak really within the genre uh, of what I do. But there are people within that genre who, I certainly have fed off, and I'd like to think maybe they've kind of fed off on me to a certain extent, but because I'm younger than them, it tends to be that way traffic. But I can, you know, people like Mike, what I've mentioned before, and Richard Batram, um, because we work in a, in a similar way, have similar ideas about local materials, using ash, using salt, um, finding, different stone dusts to make glazes with and digging clay to make slips with and so on. Um, there's, a, there's a sort of commonality to it all. So, and I wonder if sometimes someone could make such an impression on you. Um, and I think it's Dean, and I'm sorry if I pronounced your name right, Anne. She asks, you were fortunate once to meet Tatsuzo, uh, Tatsuzo Shimaoka. What yeah. impression did he leave on you? What inspiration did you draw from the visit? Can you have that, a sort of single encounter which can kind of set off a sort of explosion in your imagination? With him, not really. I have to say, I mean, I met him on three or four occasions and went to his house and had tea and so on, and he was a lovely man. He really enjoyed a good joke and a good laugh. Um, but as a living national treasure in Japan, he had, a, he had to have a certain reverential sort of... Um, attitude to him and once your allotted time was up it was kind of a glance out the window to see who was next you know it was a that kind of thing but he was he was very nice uh i can't say that his work really has influenced me much i mean not really no i don't think so um have you think ever, i mean, just wonder with someone like hamada there seems to be yeah. such an affinity between you and hamada but I wonder if there was a sort of particularly charged element in the relationship you have with his work. Oh, um, I think, I mean, I'm, a, I'm the first to admit that I have been influenced by what he did. I never met him, of, of course. Uh, I'm lucky enough to have some of his pot here. Um, which, it's almost like having an absentee tutor. You know, if Hamada was sitting next to me, looking over my shoulder, telling me how to trim a bowl or, or, or what, if I get stuck sometimes, if I kind of feel I don't quite know what where to go with that, I'll go upstairs and have a look at one or two of his pots and think, how did he do it? And for me, that's exactly the same as him sitting over my shoulder, telling me how to do it. So it's, I've got a problem. How would you solve it? Kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, I think that um, somebody said to me the other day on Facebook that um, there was a discussion going on about Hamada uh, and this particular pot that somebody had posted a photograph of it. And they were saying that they didn't think it was one of his best. And I thought it was actually quite fine, and, but, it, but it was a particularly quiet pot, a plate. And um, somebody made a comment about it was lacklustre or something. 
And I just said, you know, look, I'm sure that Hamada had failures. We all have failures. But you really have to look very hard to find a bad pot by Hamada. Yeah. And whether he smashed the bad ones or what, I'm not quite sure. But honestly, I, it's a rare thing to find a bad pot. Some of them are amazing. And some of them are just very, very good. You know, I mean, there are levels, if you like, but um, you rarely ever see a really bad one. Yeah. I mean, the standard is extraordinary, isn't mm. it? Especially um, over the length of his career. Too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I had a lovely story about um, Sandy Brown meeting him when she was on the hippie trail, but I'll save that for another time. Um, <laughs> Anne has another question. Would you and Ha Jong encourage your young son to follow in your footsteps and to one day become a potter? Will he put aside his Death Star and pick up a lump of clay, do you think? <laughs> it took us quite some time to get him into the pottery to make anything. He, um, up until the, what, he's six and a half now, probably up until the time he was six, he really, really didn't like getting his hands dirty. Yeah, it was almost an obsession. He didn't he wouldn't touch anything that was in the least bit. And then all of a sudden, it didn't matter anymore. And he was up he was up there making these little figures, um, transformers usually. Um, whether I would encourage him, I'm he wants to do. And the thing is, you know, pottery has been very good for me. Certainly for the first, what, I've been at it 40 years. The first 25 years didn't make enough money, probably. You know, now I, I've managed to travel all, to all sorts of places that I never would have gone to had I not been involved in pottery. People pay for you to go and do workshops in South Africa and Canada and Japan and America and all over Europe. I mean, I, I would never have got to, probably got to these places had it not been for pottery. So it's, it's been good for me. And um, I've never been one to worry about money ever. And um, my first wife, I never, well, all the time we were married, I never knew what money we had. And, um, and you know, grateful to her for it. But I never, I never worried about money. It was always my main concern in pottery was to just keep trying to be better than I was a year before, you know. Yeah. Um, and also, I guess, to muster the resources to do the things you want to do, to build a climbing kiln or a wood fired kiln, all that kind of stuff mm. that, you do, that you do need material resources for. You have I've been very lucky. I've been really lucky. I mean, with the kiln, um, I got to know a guy who was and still is working for British Steel and um, the bricks for the kiln came from British Steel at four pence a brick because they were all written off uh, all brand new but written off and not not usable and so we got them for I mean it cost us more to get them here than the bricks actually <laughs> cost you know so it, it was I was so lucky with him and then ever since then that was 2003 Ever since then, he has come and helped me fire it every single firing. He could fire that kiln as, as every bit as much as I could. I mean, you know, he knows it back front. Um, but it's the same, I suppose it's the same as any other business, really. You have to, you have, to have certain things in your workshop to be able to carry on. And it's no good. So, I mean, I've often said to students in the past, you know, don't be afraid to borrow money. If you can borrow money and, and be confident that you can sort of earn enough by borrowing it, that you can pay it back. That's the way to go. And that's when I bought this place 36 years ago. I borrowed up to my neck. I mean, the amount of money that this place cost 36 years ago, you, you would laugh at now. I mean, it, it seems like nothing compared to what you'd have to pay for it now. But in those days, it was a huge amount of money for me to put together. And I had to borrow almost over my head to get it. But I knew that once I'd got it and I could start my summer school, I knew that I could pay it back. Interesting. All 
I mean, you must be confident about what you're doing. There's not just time for one more question. It comes from Aaron. Sherry, did, I'm sorry, Aaron, if I mispronounced your name. And he asked, did you ever have a hard time believing in yourself when you started out? Was that confidence about your, was confidence always part of you or was it something you acquired? When I started, I did not have the benefit of any tuition, apart from some very poor tuition when I was in college. And I did very little. When I left college, I could, I could throw a pot. But I mean, I barely knew who Bernard Leach was. I barely knew anything about studio pottery. It was all about just being able to throw a pot, throw a shape or something. And <clears throat> when I, I taught for five years. And when I came here and started my first workshop, I could make pots enough were good enough to sell but they weren't of any great merit i have to say i i didn't i wasn't one of those people who, who had the benefit of um a three-year degree course with tuition from people like walter keeler and mick Casson. you know i just didn't have that so i had a lot of catching up to do. um but i always did believe in, that i could do it i could i believed that i could get better and i could get and I could get better. Otherwise, I would have given up, to be honest, because in those days I was earning about two thousand pounds a year. Yeah. You know, um, so yeah, I did have. I, I don't know about the confidence. I suppose it, the two go hand in hand. But I certainly had the belief that I could improve, and I'd been at it for probably seventy-eight, maybe eighty-two, eighty-three was the first time that I managed to sell some pots to another shop. And David Cantor, who was the secretary, or was he secretary? No, secretary or president? Yeah, secretary, I think, of the Craft Potters Association. Right. And he owned a couple of craft galleries himself. And he bought some pots for one in London and one in Dartington. And that was the first time that I actually sold anything to somebody else. And that took about five years to do that. And then I got I became a member of the CPA in '84, and that was a huge turning point. I felt that that sort of rubber stamped my. Not, it's like being RA. Kind of, yeah. yeah. And then the other big turning point in my career, if you like, was writing and publishing Ash Glazes, yeah. because that was then marketed in the united states and that helped me enormously and now you're the living national treasure phil and there's <laughs> more, more red dots than a measles epidemic out there i can tell you the pot seems to be flying i do recommend everybody if you've not had a click through to phil's uh, work of course you have done but do um because it's wonderful it's been great to talk to you phil love to yeah. have you and the family and everyone well thanks thanks for doing this uh, much appreciated my pleasure it really is and i look forward to seeing you when we can travel yeah when all this is over when all this is over come, come and have come back and have lunch again i'd love to thanks a lot Phil. All right. you take care bye bye, bye. educate, entertain our customers. Okay, so now we're going to look at some other of his prints. We're thinking very seriously about stopping making pots. But there's nothing forced. And I think his jugs are, are really the epitome of that. Hello, welcome to today's broadcast from the Goldmark Gallery. One of my most regular places to visit up in this part of the world is the Goldmark Gallery. Mm -hmm.